Good morning. It is great to be together. I'd like to welcome you, all of you that are here with us on the lawn on this beautiful day here in October. As we gather together, all of you that are online, we thank you for tuning in on Facebook and YouTube. We are so glad that as we gather, we know that Jesus has promised where two or more are gathered, he is with us, and we count on his presence. We depend on that. As we begin, I just want to make a few announcements and let you know of a few things. Today is World Communion Sunday, and those of you at home, if you haven't already, take a moment to go and gather the elements of communion. Uh, we have uh, self-contained communion cups, individual communion cups here. So if you happen to have walked up and not grabbed one, please take a moment and get one. But uh, at home, juice, bread, or crackers, whatever you can gather, as we will be taking communion together on this beautiful World, Su World Communion Sunday. Also wanna just remind you of some other things going on at two o'clock we have the college and career, I believe it's coffee and kindness, mm -hmm. or is it coffee and cheesecake? I never remember what it is exactly, but something like that. But um, check that out on on Zoom. Contact Melissa. That's at two o'clock. Also, the youth are meeting, I believe, from four to six on the front lawn, and Hector will be explaining that as we go through the rest of the morning. Um, 11 o'clock on Wednesday, don't forget about the prayer check-in. That's such an important, vital opportunity to be gathered online, but gathered together in prayer. There's so much to pray about these days. So I hope that you will join us for that prayer time. Coming up in two weeks, October the 18th, we will actually be moving inside in, into the sanctuary finally, and uh, that'll be a great opportunity. We'll be socially distancing all the same protocols that we are observing here. It will be mandatory to wear masks, and we won't be singing just like we're not now. Even with masks indoors, it'll be even more critical that we are careful to follow these protocols. We'll be checking temperatures and signing in and contact tracing. But um, in these times, now with the president and first lady being tested positive, we need to, that just reminds us, we need to be careful for those, especially who are vulnerable in our church family and help to protect over them. We're hoping that we can get things going for Sunday school gathered, maybe a collected uh, Sunday school program for all the kids, the teens with their own. Um, we'll give you more details about that as we go get closer to the 18th. But um, the Sunday school department is working on that, hoping that the teachers, we can get enough teachers to staff some sort of, of uh, Sunday school by the 18th. Also, uh, well, we will probably be asking you to make some kind of reservations. Let us know, communicate with us if you're coming to come indoors and how many are gonna be with you so that we can kind of make sure that we have everything covered, that we have room, if in the sanctuary, perhaps in overflow. But we're working hard on that. I wanna thank all of the setup team, um, Mr. Blue Claws himself, Dave Cavanaugh and uh, all the rest of the team setting up on Sunday mornings and our sound team, our video team, and also our ushers. Tremendous work to get all of this together, tremendous help, and we are blessed to have so many working so hard to make this happen. So let's take a moment now as we begin our worship. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you, we exalt you, we lift you up and thank you for such a beautiful day, such an opportunity 
to gather in worship, whether it be on the lawn or in the cars or in our homes online. We thank you that you are with us wherever we are, that you are uniting us together in love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we ask, that we might sense your presence, be drawn to you in love and to love one another, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Sharon Nunn and Bob Burdick are going to join with Barbara Estelle with our music team this morning as we remember Holy, Holy, Holy. Well, good morning, everyone, and everybody watching at home. And uh, so I did want to give just a, a, maybe a little more clarification on a few uh, announcements. Uh, the first one being uh, with youth, we will be meeting outside our, uh, Lydia and I's uh, home. Uh, we're gonna make a fire and uh, do a couple of things outside. The reason we're meeting from four to six is we need to take advantage of the fact that uh, we still have sunlight. Uh, and so if you have a teen in sixth grade through 12, and wants to come out will be on our front lawn which is uh as soon as you drive into the church driveway there's a house on the left that's our house so we welcome you to uh join us there from four to six and uh and then the second one is uh something that we're really excited about some of the members from the church already know a little bit about this uh but we want to uh attempt to do a trunk or treat just as an opportunity to bless uh our community let them know that that uh not everything's canceled uh we want to do it safe and and effectively um, and, and so, uh, as you walked in, um, Mel had uh, set up a little sign-up sheet. Um, yeah, for, for just the, you know, uh, the, the things that we're looking for in terms of if you want to donate um, your, your time uh, or, or donate some candy. Uh, we will need uh, a number of cars to be able to decorate their trunks and, and be uh, willing to, to hand out some, some candy. We'll also need a lot of volunteers. So we are going to be setting up, uh, you know, uh, the, a way to um, have you guys uh, electronically uh, or in person uh, sign up to be able to help out with that because I know a couple of people already reached out to me and uh, it, it's going to be a really fun event happening October 24th with the rain date being the uh, 25th. Uh, so keep your eye out for more and more details about that that we'll mention here and on also online on, uh, on Facebook. But uh, um, I wanted to talk uh, again uh, a little bit about the fact that, uh, so last week I mentioned how important it was to, to have enough sleep, right? If you're, if you're a, a, a kid or even if you're an adult, sleep is an important thing. And, um, and, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about sleep and, and about giving you some tips um, to help you to sleep. Now, sleep is an, an amazing, amazing gift from God, isn't it? Like, is there anybody here that, or at home that would say, I hate sleep? <laughs> no, right? You'd be like some kind of psychopath, you know, crazy person, everybody loves sleep. And it's an awesome gift from God. And it's a reminder that we're not God. Do you know that the Bible says that God, he doesn't need to take naps. He doesn't slumber or sleep, right? He watches over us. And that should give us rest in the idea that, man, I don't have to keep working and trying to do all this stuff for myself. I can rest knowing that God's got it. He doesn't need to sleep. I do. <laughs> and so I wanted to give you a few tips on things that will help you to fall asleep. Hence the fact that I wore my PJs this morning, right? Because when you sleep, uh, I know some of you guys are like, hmm, I, th I think Hector's just lost it a little bit. He's, he's starting to slip. But um, when you sleep, you want to have comfy clothes. You want to let your hair down, right? Um, <laughs> you, you don't want to have shoes on, right? Because you don't, no, you, you don't want to, you want to let your feet breathe 
and, and, and your hands breathe. And, and, you know, there's a lot of mud and guck and, you know, dust and stuff. You don't want to get that in your bed, right? Um, and, and, and so, yeah, so, so you want to you wanna sleep. Now, I, even though I'm giving you a, a few tips about falling asleep, nobody here should be falling asleep today during Pastor Al's sermon, right? So, anyway, you're... <laughs> You want to get really nice and comfy, Dave, you can still get me, right? You can still see me? All right, perfect. Um, you know, some people used to wear little sleep hats. Um, you know, just something to kind of make you feel a little cozier. I know this doesn't exactly look like a sleep hat, but it was the closest thing I'd got. So let me give this a, a shot. Let me see. Hmm. You know what, though? I still, I still kind of hear a lot of sounds and noises and stuff. So you know what people do sometimes is they will, or, or if like you have somebody that's, that's in your room with you that snores a lot, oh gosh, um, you want to make sure that you bring some, uh, some noise canceling headphones with you. Let me see what that looks like here. Oh, that's great. Oh my goodness. I can almost fall asleep right here. But uh, you know what? Gosh, there's, there's a lot of sunlight over here. I think... I think I need to put on a, a, a little sleep mask sometimes to see people. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so much better. Oh my goodness. That's great. That's really, uh, really nice. Ooh, but you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm kind of cold and maybe, maybe I just need a little blanket here too. Oh my gosh. You guys are just so jealous of me right now, aren't you? <laughs> Oh, oh boy. Except for you guys at home probably, right? You probably look a little closer to this, right? So here's, here's the thing about, about why we set up all these kind of walls, right? Or, or th there's little barriers that we need. And the reason that we do those is because there's things that are going to distract us from getting our sleep or from getting our rest, from us being able to get peace, right? There's going to be a lot of distractions. And that's true for our sleep, but that's also true for our hearts and our lives, right? There are things that try to go in and steal the peace that God and the rest that God gives us. And so Pastor Al today is going to be talking about somebody one time that encouraged people to, to, to build defenses, right? To build defenses because I don't know if you know this, but there, the evil really is going to try to steal that joy and that peace that God has given us, right? And so sometimes, you know, God helps us by reminding us that, hey, you know what? Sometimes you need to, you need to have some barriers, you need to have some boundaries that you set up to, to protect yourself, right? So, um, uh, pastor's going to be uh, talking about that a little later, but you know what? Let, let's do something that, that brings all of us a lot, a lot of peace, and that's the fact that we can talk to God, our Heavenly Father, that perfect parent that loves us so, so very much. There's a lot of scary things going on right now, um, but it's good to know that we can go and talk to God, right? We're, we're, there's a lot of hurting people, but let's, let's pray for them, and let's pray for ourselves too, all right? Let's pray together. Oh God, our great God who gives us rest, who delights in giving us rest and, and, and peace. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for that. Uh, but God, you know, we also do confess that for some of us, it, it's been hard. It's been hard to, to find rest and peace, God, because there's so, so many difficult things, Lord. But on this day, we, we declare that you're still good, that you don't need to fall asleep, God. You're not falling asleep on your watch. You watch over us and you care for us, Lord. And so we thank you for being God, because that means we don't have to. Thank you, Lord, for giving us rest, that it's not about our, our, our works and efforts, Lord God, but it's already what you have done. So we, we give you thanks first and foremost for that, God. But God, we, we place before you just all of our anxieties, all of our fears, all of our hurts, God. We thank you, God, for the many ways that you have healed us and, and, you've, and you've brought restoration. But Lord, there's so many of us that are still hurting, God. There's so many of us that are just carrying different weights, Lord. You know, whether that's illnesses in our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds, Lord. God, there, there's so many of us who are mourning the loss of, of people that we love that are dear to us. We thank you, Jesus, that you have given us victory over death, God, that you have the last say over it, God. Thank you so much for that. But Lord, just like you cried, you cried with those who, when, when, when uh, Martha and Mary lost Lazarus, you cried with them, God. You, we know that you cry also with everyone who's mourning. Whether that's the loss of a loved one or a pet, God, the loss of friendships, 
the fact that we're, we're separated from loved ones, Lord. You, you mourn with us, God. But Lord, we also know that you're in control and we look, so we look to you and we ask, God, for you to, to come through, Lord. Bring about your victory, God. Heal us in the way that we need. Father, um, it, it's definitely a scary time and, and so we, we, pray, we pray for our president, Lord. We pray for his family. We pray for all of those people that have been impacted, God. Not just the ones that are, are public figures, but God, there are, are ones that uh, maybe everybody has forgotten, but you haven't forgotten about them. And so we pray for all these people, all of us that are uh, impacted with the pandemic. God, rescue us, Lord. We ask for, for your wisdom, God. We ask for, you, for your patience and strength because it's difficult on so many ways. It's difficult, God. So give us the strength to get through and, and, and to maintain. Lord, we, we pray for those that, that are facing the prospect of not having work. We pray for those that are hungry right now, Lord. We pray for those that, that don't have a home right now or are in danger of losing one, Lord. God, if we, would you place your hand upon those that are, are uh, um, landlords and, 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 and allow your mercy and your grace to, to, to flow in their hearts too. God, we pray, Lord, for, for every part of this world that's just going through turmoil and violence, and we ask for your peace to, to break through, Lord. We thank you for the protections that we have seen, Lord. But God, we pray for those, those parts of our, of our earth that are, are seeing violence, God. And we ask for, for the violence to cease, Lord. Please, Lord, stir in our hearts that we might have uh, love towards, towards each other. Help us, God, to love our enemies, Lord. Help us, God, when, when it's so, so difficult to do so. And we thank you, Jesus, that you set that example, Lord. So help us to follow after you. God, we continue to pray for our young people and for our teachers to keep them safe, Lord, to, to help them grow during this time. Father, we, just, we, we know that our futures are in your hands. We know that you're in control, Lord, but, but we don't see the future sometimes the way, the way that you do, Lord. So thank you for being patient with us. Help us to trust you more, Lord. God, we pray for pastor on this day and just ask that, that you would fill him with your words, Lord. Anoint him with your spirit. Allow him to, to, to speak. And God, may we have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you might say. We thank you for all that you're doing, God, and we thank you that, you that we can be a part of what you're doing on this earth. Thank you for loving us so, so very much, God. And so, Lord, we, we lay all of our hearts and our lives before you, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you love us. And so we pray all the hidden things that are in our hearts before you, and we pray the way that you taught us to pray, Lord, when you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And, and it's been awesome to really see um, everyone join together uh, in, in this tough time and, and continue the work that is going forward uh, here at St. Paul's. Uh, and, and so it's in that attitude of, of, of thanksgiving and of, uh, of joy that we glad, gladly give. And, uh, and we also give our gifts in song. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was fantastic. I really appreciate God using you and you allowing God using you in your ministry of music and blessing God's people together with us. This morning, I'd like to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. It's probably been a while since... You heard a message on the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. It's a historical book. After 
the exile of the Jews in Babylon. Now they're back. And I think that the context of the people of God returning is kind of a parallel. We've considered that when we looked at the prophet Haggai a while back. Anyhow, as we think about this time in which we live, this particular context, I'm thinking every day as I watch the news, as I see what's going on in the world, Will we ever survive this? Will we ever survive this? How will we survive this time? With the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been going on for six months at least. Now, with the first family having tested positive for it, even our former governor here, Chris Christie, in the hospital with COVID, we're not out of the woods yet. In this time, not only the health crisis, but also with contentious politics, with debates that you can barely survive watching for 90 minutes. Man, how will we survive this? With protests and violence on our city streets, racism rampant, riotous reactions to that. How will we ever survive? And now during this specific time, restaurants, businesses, schools, churches, Sunday schools reopening, we hope, open or not, what should we do? How should we do it? The stress of these decisions is tough to deal with. It's almost like our society as a whole is in survival mode. How can we make it through this time? We know that it's going to get better. We think it's going to get better sometime, somehow. But as we think about our new sermon series, More Than Survivors, how we can be thriving spiritually in this and all times. We've been finding practical keys from the scripture for thriving spiritually, to be more than overcomers, as the Bible says, as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, looking for tips in the scripture from biblical heroes. Last week we considered Moses. Today we want to look at Nehemiah and his life and witness. We'll also be looking at Joseph and Esther and Daniel and Paul and Ruth other biblical heroes to consider the Im impact, the importance of thriving with the abundant life of Jesus that he promised us as believers. So this morning, lessons from Nehemiah. Nehemiah? Who was Nehemiah? He was a Jew living in a foreign land. He was living after the Babylonian exile for 70 years, the people of God had been taken away into exile. King Nebuchadnezzar, now the Medes and the Persians in the citadel of Susa, Persian king, city of Jerusalem had been ransacked, burned, looted in 586 BC, and now, more than 70 years later, Nehemiah, off in exile, had heard disturbing reports about the conditions in Jerusalem from the first wave of those who returned to rebuild the city and the temple. And he was in mourning, he was deeply distressed, as he was in a particularly good position. He was in a position of honor as the cupbearer in the court of King Artaxerxes there in Susa. And he was able to leverage that position to gather resources and return and help to rebuild Jerusalem. So I want to pick up in Nehemiah chapter 2 
after King Artaxerxes had given him permission to return. Nehemiah writes, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, and there was not enough room for my mouth to even get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates are burned with fire. Come. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me, and what the king had said to me, encouraging me to rebuild. Then all the people replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. This morning my message is entitled Resolve to Resoul as we make a resolution to revive our hearts, to resoul our spirits, to continue to be strong in the Lord, thriving in our spiritual lives. In this book of Nehemiah, it's all about the wall. It's all about the wall, the historical context. There in Jerusalem, the walls had been broken down. As I said, in 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had sacked the city. And now, more than 70 years later, the first wave of the Jews returned after 70 years of judgment and exile in a foreign land, returning to rebuild their homes, to rebuild the temple. At this point, as Nehemiah writes, Haggai and Ezra had motivated the people to rebuild God's house, the temple, but the, the, the walls around the city were still in disrepair. It's slow going, and Nehemiah had been mourning in the presence of this Persian king, noticed by him, somewhere around the time of 446 B.C., well, what's the big deal about a wall? What's in a wall? For people back then, and for many, even today, it's essential for the survival of city inhabitants to have defenses, to keep enemies and hostile elements out. And I think about, well, even now I see a chipmunk under, Melissa, don't get too excited. I'm not worried about chipmunks, but groundhogs or lions and tigers and bears, oh my, um, whatever it is, to keep enemies out and to keep and contain precious elements. We build fences to keep things in, like our children, like our pets, like our dogs, like our guinea pigs, ferrets, whatever they are. We want to be sure that we are safe within and without. Now, Nehemiah's wall was not just any wall. It was a wall around Jerusalem, the city of David, the holy city, the city of God. Plus, the temple, the holy temple of God was in this city of Jerusalem, the symbol of God's presence. This was most important. Now, some of you probably are thinking 
by now you're making connections and thinking, huh, building a wall. I want to be very, very, very clear. In today's hyper-politicized climate, when we talk about building a wall, we're not speaking about the politics of the day. Are you following me? I am not talking about a border wall with Mexico. Whatever you think and feel about that debate, that's not my point. So don't go home and say, not past, okay? Please be very clear. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking historically, but I'm also talking about a wall of a different sort, a spiritual wall around our hearts, around our souls, a wall to wall out our spiritual invaders and invasions. Nehemiah's second line of defense, perhaps his first line of defense, was a spiritual wall. And I want you to follow me very carefully. Nehemiah knew that survival meant setting up certain boundaries, walls against spiritual incursions, invasions, especially in this case, reestablishing a boundary wall of Sabbath protection. And I have a little book that I've been reading. In fact, I find the inspiration for this series, a book by Karen Maines called Soul Alert. It's a little book, but it's a great book, thriving spiritually as aliens and strangers in the world. And in this book, one of my favorite preachers, Bill Hybels of Wool Creek Community Church back a while ago, used to always say that don't be uh, misled. Everything that preachers share is either bought, stolen, or borrowed, mostly. <laughs> and in this case, I give credit to Karen and David Maines. This is this idea of the wall of survival thriving spiritually comes from this book, Sabbath Rest Protection. Karen Maines talks about Sabbath, sabbatical rest, refreshment, soul survival, revival. We need to think about that today, just as they did back in Nehemiah's time. Nehemiah was instrumental. Here's a quote from Karen Maines. Nehemiah was instrumental, even under stressful circumstances, in seeing the walls around Jerusalem were restored. Even though that was quite an accomplishment, it was not enough. Soon, a wall of a different kind, listen, a different kind was necessary to protect the people spiritually. Are you following me? One day each week had to be walled off from the other six. God's Sabbath needed to be restored. We can ask ourselves today how important it is to include quality time in our schedule for resouling, spiritual refreshment. Those who are more than survivors today set aside time in schedules to recalibrate spiritually. Today, they need to intentionally build a wall around a part of their week to honor God's Sabbath principle, to honor God's Sabbath principle and restore their soul. And they thrive knowing that a proven defense system against the enemy is in place. It comes straight out of this book of the Bible in Nehemiah. If you're still in Nehemiah, pick up with me later in the book in chapter 13. I want to read another passage that talks about this second phase two wall. Nehemiah 13, beginning with verse 15. In those days, I saw men in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath, bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. They were bringing in all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. 
Men from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem and on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I, Nehemiah, rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your forefathers do the same things so that God brought all this calamity upon us and upon this city? Now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered that the doors be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites and priests to purify themselves and go guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, O oh my God, and show mercy to me according to your great law. You see, the people of God had forgotten his will, his law, his commands, the fourth command of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Not as a legalistic burden, but as a gift from God, just as Hector was talking about early, earlier. We have rest offered. It's a gift. God's intent was that we might have rest refreshment, restoration, that we might be resold, revived, replenished in a stressed out society with restless, hyperactive culture. Give me a break. We need to continue to say the same thing. As we return to normal from this COVID pandemic, however, whenever, whatever that means. We need to be careful not to fall into the old traps and bad habits. Working seven days a week, Jews were falling into bad habits as they returned in the Old Testament times to Jerusalem. Same with us today. Resoling takes deliberate, intentional resolve because it's radically countercultural for us today. Already, I am, and probably many of you are already feeling the riptide cultural current drawing us, sucking us back into crazy schedules, frantic families, already trying to figure out how to schedule, get back into schedule all kinds of sports activities, music activities, dance activities. Now let me just say, I sympathize with families that have to make difficult decisions about schedules on Sunday and so forth. You know, I won't be hypocritical and say that I don't know what you're dealing with because as my sons were younger, they played on traveling soccer teams on Sunday we had to negotiate and navigate how we could do that. But somehow, according to our consciences, biblically defined, we need to guard our hearts, guard our souls against priorities encroaching on the sacred spaces of our souls. If you want to more, just, more than just survive this day, this generation, more than just survive, but thrive spiritually. You have to take this Sabbath principle as a gift from God and figure out how to do this. Resolve to resoul. I have one more page I'm going to read to you from Karen Maine's book. Brick by brick, repairing the breach in our spiritual walls from secular values. Here's a concept that may be new to you. Observing the Sabbath is more than just going to church. It is a whole different approach to living out the week, week after week, year after year. This is a Sabbath principle. 
God asks us to give him at least 24 hours each week. This is so far from the common practice of most Christians in our contemporized society that it boggles the mind to think of how Ray's torn down the protective wall has become around our spiritual life. Keeping the Sabbath holy is much, much more than going to church on Sunday mornings, although it includes that, and worship. It is learning to live within the Sabbath's sacred with rhythm, which God has designed for our good. Many of you remember all kinds of legalisms growing up in earlier generations brought down. I know in Ocean Grove people weren't allowed to drive a car on Sunday. Well, I'm not talking about legalisms. I'm talking about a principle with which we can guard our souls. In the Old and New Testaments, each new day began at sundown so that for practicing Jews, Sabbath begins on Friday evening. Even today, in our Lakewood community, our, our Jewish friends, begins on Friday evening and continues for 24, even 26 hours until Saturday evening at sundown. The day is so rich and rewarding, or it can be, that Jews begin to anticipate it and plan for it, much as we anticipate and plan for a sabbatical recreational, recreational vacation. So meaningful, they carry the warmth and joy all the way through into Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, when the weekly cycle begins afresh. This sacred rhythm enfolds the entire week, week after week, and creates holy space within the soul so that it has time to grow and to thrive. Breathe in, breathe out, inhale, exhale. This is the process of resouling that everyone who practices Sabbath experiences. The reason why God has given us this great gift. Sabbath is a border wall that keeps us safe, keeps intruders out, and reminds us that we, who we are, and helps us to remain whole and holy for every one of us today. We need to identify the kinds of activities that tend to recharge our spiritual batteries, that resource our spiritual and emotional and physical resources, and build walls protecting these activities. Maybe you connect with God best when you're walking outdoors and enjoying the beauty of creation, perhaps gathering in some form or fashion with Christian friends and family restores you, perhaps choosing to spend extra time reading the Bible or a devotional book. Perhaps you've heard about Martin Luther who in his quiet time daily had this rhythm where he would spend two hours a day in prayer with the Lord except for days that he was especially busy. On those days, Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, said on those days in which he was especially busy, he needed to spend three hours in prayer to restore his soul. So perhaps a good Christian novel or a book of poetry can refresh your spirit. Some people restore by doing such acts as acts of mercy, visiting shut-ins, or helping a homeless shelter. If your nature is contemplative, you might take time in extended quiet and prayer. See how countercultural this is? Well, during this time of COVID pandemic, we've been forced to quarantine. Perhaps God has given us a moment in time to reset, to reestablish certain rhythms. Because of differences in personalities and vocations, resouling can look different for each one of us. 
my weekly schedule, certainly a Sunday is not a day of rest for me. I need to set aside and guard another day of the week, and I usually do that on Tuesday. In fact, my boss, the DS, will ask me more than annually, are you taking your personal Sabbath? Ironically, this week, as a matter of fact, we have annual conference that encroaches on my Sabbath on Tuesday, Monday, tomorrow and Tuesday. So I'm going to have to figure out another day of this week to take my personal Sabbath. But it's so important. Resolutely, relentlessly guarding and protecting your time of resouling refreshment for Christ's sake and your sake. As things reopen in our society and we turn to a new normal, whatever that is, believe me, it's a matter of spiritual life and death. It's a matter of spiritual survival of your soul. If you're going to survive more than survive, thrive spiritually. Take a tip from the faithful witness of Nehemiah. Each of us needs to resolve to resoul on a regular basis. I worry about what's going to happen as things open up again. We're kind of out of the habit of coming to church. I just love being together with you. It's going to be easy, especially now that we're out of sync, out of cycle. God loves you and wants the best for you. So prayerfully, carefully, consider what this might mean as you apply it to your life. Not legalistically, not as a matter of law, but a matter of grace, a gift of rest. Okay, I forgot to mention that if you wanted to sleep during the sermon and rest, no. I appreciate anybody of you that stayed awake. But anyhow, take a nap. Sometime. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and kindness, for your love for us. That you desire good things. That you desire rest as a taste of heaven. Even as the things in this life grow strangely dim, we long for your glory and grace in which we will see you face to face. So help us to anticipate entering into your rest forever. In Jesus' name, amen. As we transition to a time of communion, again, I'm using the liturgy, the order of service from that we use during our midweek worship. So let us prepare our hearts. And hopefully, if any of you did not pick up a cup, don't have a personal cup for communion, you can grab some in the back there. Friends, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As we gather this morning in celebration of the Lord's Supper, we hear again the story of God's mighty acts of love, embodied in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We are given assurance of the Lord's presence through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sins before the Lord. O Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have had anxieties about the future, even though we proclaim you as Lord. We have failed to love our neighbors, and we have disobeyed your commands. Have mercy upon us, Lord Jesus. 
forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we may walk in your ways and serve you in grace and in love as we ask. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, bless this time and all who gather here, here together on our property or online, virtually. Bless these gifts of bread and the cup that they may be for us, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Remembering as he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant, the new testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. On this World Communion Sunday, we join with Christian believers all around the world of all different denominations in remembering Jesus, how he took bread, the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, broken for you. Take the wafer underneath the first film. <laughs> Remember how he died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. blood of Christ shed for you. God so loves you. Christ died for you. As you take this cup of a new covenant in his blood, remember him and be thankful. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we give you great thanks for your amazing grace, for the rest, the restoration, the refreshment of our souls, the nourishment of our souls and bodies that you give by your grace and mercy. We thank you for your kindness and love. May we be kind and loving to all those that you place before us throughout this week, that we might share your grace with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. Sharon and Barb are going to join Barbara again for another song, Take Time to Be Holy.
Thank you guys so much. Take time to be holy. I recognize how challenging this message is as it comes across to all of us to spend quality time with God is so strange in our culture, in our day and age. Spending quality time with our families, with our spouse. It's hard to balance all this. But God has given you the gift of time in his presence. Take it as a gift as you go from here. We love you. We thank you. We pray for you, pray for us. We thank you for your gifts, for your generosity, keeping us strong that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the word of God may continue to go out from St. Paul's United Methodist Church strongly and consistently. We're looking forward to time in which we'll be moving indoors on the 18th. You'll hear more about that as we go forward. But let us be in prayer for our church for one another, for our nation, for our president, and for all those who lead. Be blessed and be a blessing as you go forth from here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen. Amen.